Hello everyone, welcome back to OCD Recovery's YouTube channel. I wanted to talk about a video that's on the internet called How to Recover from the Dire Need of Love by Albert Ellis. It's an hour and a half lecture. I do recommend many people watch that. In this video, I'm kind of going to take my own little twist on it. Since the video, when he made this, there were certain things that people were doing that they still do today. And there are certain things that people are doing today that weren't really an option back then because there was no social media. Uh, the world wasn't uh, materialistic and being materialistic has always been, and that's not inherently good or bad, but can be problematic if taken too far. Um, people do like objects, clothes, money, uh, vacations, flaunting and stuff like that. But the problem becomes be because most people, when they do that, they're attaching their entire meaning and their self-worth to those things. So before I go any further, don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, comment down below on some of the things maybe I missed some of the things you would like me to cover again, uh, maybe going into more detail in certain aspects of this. Uh, I will be doing another video specifically talking about social media and internet compulsions, because I think that is a large place where conditional self-acceptance and the dire need for self-esteem to kind of um, perpetuate in ways where compulsive avoidance in craving acceptance can really take place. Now, it's, it's really kind of impossible to talk about this topic without having a really good understanding of the third book on the reading list, which is The Myth of Self-Esteem. Now, The Myth of Self-Esteem is a, is a meaty book, very philosophical, potentially one of the hardest books that someone might read because it's very foreign. Whenever you read something that's foreign and the ideas, uh, the ideologies, the perceptions, breaking down societal barriers, especially in ways that every single person believes, you know, in the business world, in the finance world, in the relationship world, in the spiritual world, that self-esteem is the major component to actually reaching your goals. But I'm going to talk about a topic that might be foreign to some people. If you've come into OCD recovery and have read the books on the reading list, especially that book, it's titled The Myth of Self-Esteem. Now, what self-esteem is, in the fourth chapter, which is Psychotherapy and the Value of a Human, it's a very good chapter because it breaks down why self-esteem in easy practical terms, it's the easiest chapter in the book and the most applicable to people who have fears surrounding morals and values, why we don't need self-esteem like we believe. Now, building your self-worth per se in your own ideas, in your own perceptions, isn't inherently bad. The reason why it's bad for almost everyone without practicing this is Let's say I have a goal of getting in shape and getting my body in shape. Nothing wrong with that goal. The problem with that is the behavioral components that lie in that goal can that can be a problem, such as compulsively exercising, compulsively looking for control over your macronutrient intake, the compulsive need to post your progress in social media, um, and all sorts of stuff like that. That could be a slippery slope because when you don't reach those things, and as we all age, and one of my favorite quotes from my own mother is with her Staten Island accent, hey Nicholas, when you get older, everyone looks like shit. And that's such a, <laughs> that's such a, an amazing kind of stoic uh, in her own New Yorker way that is, is funny because it is the truth. So when you put your entire identity on yourself, on a relationship, on the need for looking for love, if you put your need, as Dr. Albert Ellis explains in this talk, on your happiness being derived from other people, you're really kind of setting yourself up for this slippery slope of failure because no one else can fulfill happiness or contentment in the way that most people imagine. Happiness and contentment, in my opinion, my stoic philosophical outlook on life, comes from my ability to set goals, move towards them, ups and downs and hardships, striving for things in my relationship and my marriage. I've been married for almost four years, together for almost seven, the longest relationship in my life. So I, I talk about it today is very much similar to running a business. One of my buddies, Matt, who's my hiking friend, we talked about this, uh, we talk about this a lot. You know, building a substantial relationship is realizing that you're not gonna like every component about your, your partner. You're not, in quote unquote, universal terms, supposed to like every quote about your partner. You don't have to share the same values as your partner. There's a large persisting myth out there that the only way a relationship can work is if you have the same values. Now, I'm not saying that having the same values as your partner isn't a great aspect to a relationship. It makes certain things easier if you have the same parenting styles, if you have similar likes, but that's not the reality of most people. We're, we're two different people coming together for the means of more than likely combined incomes, something that most people don't want to talk about. Um, and, and other things too, besides just always feeling and thinking that you're in love. 
Now, love is completely subjective to different people in different time periods. And what Albert Ellis was talking about in this speech is that people will drive themselves crazy to the point of neurosis, ROCD, if you're prone to obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, even PTSD, panic disorder and GAD, any of the anxiety-based spectrum disorders, that, and even body dysmorphia, where you're constantly need, you have to look a certain way for your partner or something. And, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to look a certain way for your partner, but breaking down the need to look a certain way, breaking down the need for love is really important. Now, this isn't just in relationships. I think that's something that Albert Ellis obviously was pertaining primarily to, talking about primarily in that talk. And there's also ways that it can become looking for the dire need of acceptance of your of yourself, not just the dire need for looking for love for a partner. It could be dire need for looking for acceptance of love of your friends and family members. Excuse me. But she does touch on those things as well. Um, friends and family members, people that you don't even know on social media. And I want to talk about real quick some of those, and th that's the intro I want to talk about. Now I want to segue into some of the behaviors that you might be doing that could be holding you back for the dire need of acceptance. Now, first I want to talk about the reality of just of just life for, for most people. I enjoy looking good, right? And, and that involves um, wearing maybe nicer clothes and um, taking care of my beard and getting a haircut once a month. Um, being in shape and stuff like that. I think those things are important to me. I think they also have a, applicability in life. The problem was, as I said in the beginning, I held too much value on those things as they could be taken away at any moment. When you look at the basis of Stoicism and you look at the principles of Stoicism, what they're talking about is this. Anything that you hold on to too tightly, aka love and the dire need for love and acceptance of other people, when it's taken away from you, which it can be in the, in the blink of an eye, whether that's in a motor vehicle accident, being kicked out of your company, your parents deciding not to talk to you, whatever it may be, people will tumble into depression, maybe chronic shame and guilt and anxiety without even actually having an anxiety-based disorder. This goes way beyond the spectrum of neurosis and, and, and disorder-based issues. This is just affects every single person until they learn how to look at things in the manner of, okay, uh, I'd like a relationship, I'm going to do what it takes to get a relationship. In my humble opinion, I think there's healthier ways. Um, balancing dating apps is key. Many people are lost in the dating app world. So those compulsive behaviors that you might be doing is compulsively swiping on Tinder and Bubble, compulsively changing your profile picture, compulsively searching for the right quotes to make yourself look applicable and, and appealing to other people, compulsively bragging about your money, compulsively searching for money in order to look a certain way, and there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with looking a certain way. But it's the dire chase and the need that people think that, that they, they actually require to be accepted. Now, being accepted is great. It's a huge part of life. We're herd creatures. But we actually don't need to be accepted in the way that the, the entire human population, any place, anywhere, any culture, any time period, unless you learn the stuff through rational thinking through Ellis, apply the tools from Stoicism, I like to be accepted. I do. I would be lying to you if I said I didn't, but I don't need it. I'm pretty sure I could just live in a van in the, in the middle of the woods for the rest of my life and be just as, as content as I was if I was a popular uh, basketball player or a soccer player, American football and stuff like that, or, or anything like that, or a celebrity. I think that there's nothing wrong with those things. There's certain philosophies out there, such as Epicureanism, where they think there's nothing good at all that comes from fame and wealth. I disagree with that. I think that fame and wealth are just things that happen in life. But if you have a poor mindset of behind those things, that's when things get into trouble, right? You become a celebrity, you fall off a little bit. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm not an A-list celebrity anymore. And you crumble into depression. Instead so of like, hey, I had a good run. This is upsetting. I'm frustrated, but maybe I can find something new. But that dire need of approval is almost like the hamster on the hamster wheel. And on your, as you're on the hamster wheel, you have like a sign in front of you that says acceptance, but you can never, ever, ever reach it conditional acceptance and self-esteem. Uh, if you hear us say conditional self-acceptance, what we're actually talking about is self-esteem. Where unconditional self-acceptance is, I have goals, I'd like to reach them, I'll do whatever it takes at times to reach them. Sometimes I might be balanced, sometimes I'll lose sleep, but I could still go for those goals. Now in a relationship sense, the dire search for, for love that gets people in trouble is, I would, would like it if I stayed in my relationship for the rest of my life, but Erica's a separate person with separate perspectives on her own life journey. She might change those perspectives at any moment in time. Maybe she meets someone. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe she comes home one day and says, hey, I've kind of been seeing someone behind your back, and I think that would definitely make me cry and make me upset. But I don't think 
it would lead me to chronic depression and chronic anxiety because I realize that there's no universal truth in life that that may not happen. There's also no universal truth in life that says you need to be in a relationship. There's many people that go their entire life and they're never in a relationship. They never have children. They never have a family for whatever reasons that they have and that's what they choose to do. So again, I think it's important to encompass everything we talked about so far. Remember in the opening, we talked about what conditional self-acceptance was and self-esteem, how people get caught into the trap, some of the compulsive behaviors people may or may not be doing, and kind of just the overall aspect of, of what it entails to be conditional about love and probably cause yourself, excuse my language, a bunch of fucking problems. Now, it's important to, to finish this talk with, you know, you're, maybe you're thinking, well, that's great, Nick, I maybe know that. How do I move past that? Now, that's where you have the ABCs, right? Activating events, belief systems, and consequence. So most people, the activating event would say, you know, getting love or being in a relationship, family members, intimate partners, friendships. And the belief system is, I must prove my work to them. I must always be in love. I must feel love. I must feel like I'm in love all the time. If I don't, I'm a horrible person. I'm not worth it. I'm a louse. That can lead up to the compulsive behaviors. Because inside the C, with the activating event, wanting to be in the relationship, the belief systems we just stated, and the consequence has two parts. And then the consequence, we have emotions, and then we have behaviors. And then this particular picture, this is the unhealthy cycle, the irrational cycle, so panic, rage, vengefulness, obsessive compulsiveness. Remember, obsessive compulsiveness is not just obsessive compulsive disorder. I know many people who are obsessive and compulsive and they don't have OCD and their life is very hindered in many ways without them knowing it. Sometimes you're so blind, especially when you're not chronically suffering that you can't see it as easy as we can. So it's important to realize that OCD and anxiety suffers. You're very lucky for this. You have something showing you, as Paul Little says, like, Hey, chronic rumination, intrusive thoughts. Maybe I stuck on this. I should change that. You know, would probably benefit my life. And then the behaviors is everything we talked about with seeking approval, changing clothing styles, changing hairstyles, always needing to be a part of a group and so forth and so forth. And again, none of those are inherently bad, but when unwatched, it can be a problem. So those are really key to cover. Now, how do we finish this off with the healthy cycle? Well, the activating event is the same. The relationships, family members, intimate partners, so forth, so forth. But the belief system is a little bit different. The belief system is, you know, I would really like to be in love with someone. I would really like to have a relationship or a family or be accepted by others. But the key word is the but. As there's no universal truth, as there's no universal deservingness, I don't actually need these things in the way that I imagine. And that is so critical because when you go into your now new emotional consequence, because your new effective philosophy, this will all be broken down in the first book on the reading list, how to stubbornly refuse to make yourself miserable about anything, yes, anything. We have the new emotions. The emo new emotions might be sadness, uh, remorse, unhealthy um, uh, regret, and stuff like that. And then the, the behaviors might be that you want to get in shape. You want to maybe change your life and your lifestyle factors, realizing that you don't need to do those things. There's benefits to them, but you don't need to. You could stay and, and be irrational for the rest of your life. Most people do that. 99.99999% of people stay irrational for the rest of their life. And because they're not chronically suffering as we are, they don't even know it. So it's really important to, to really look at that. I do recommend going back and watching that video. Just type in Albert Ellis, The Dire Need for Love on YouTube. It comes up. It's an hour and a half. Maybe sit down, you know, put it up on the TV and, and, and just listen to it. It's a great, it's a great listen for everyone. I think it would be benefit people in schools. Um, people don't, I mean, if anyone, everyone listened to it on earth, whether they agreed or not, I still think there might be a nugget or two of knowledge that they could take from that. Uh, so thank you so much for watching. Again, if you're always interested in the webinars, please email phil at ocdrecovery.com. We have OCD Recovery Part 1, 2, and 3 coming up. It's like August 29th, September 3rd, September 9th or something like that. Uh, and, and, and they're great. We will do one. I think we might actually cover one specifically on this topic, not just ROCD. This is very intertwined into ROCD, but maybe just outside that. So thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions down below, if you like these type of videos, if you want to see more philosophical videos, just let me know. And as always, have a great day.